So very warm welcome to everyone, a very good afternoon. Um, it gives me great pleasure to introduce you to the fourth of our fellowship lunchtime seminars. If you remember, we've had them on weeks two, four, six and eight, and we already have uh, three slots filled for next term. So if anybody would like to volunteer to do the fourth slot, there is one slot left. Um, so the point of these seminars is very much to give our, our fantastic fellowship and the work going on on our fellowship, giving a platform so all of us can start to understand um, uh, that we have, um, uh, well, understand the sort of work going on across the college. And our fourth speaker today is going to talk to us about a really extraordinary topic, and I'm very much looking forward to this, and our speaker is uh, Dr Luke Parry. So Luke is one of our early career research and teaching fellows in Earth Sciences, based in the Hall, but he's also based in the Department of Earth Sciences as well, doing his postdoctoral work. But Luke is no stranger to Oxford. He did his undergraduate degree at St Anne's um, here in Oxford in the Department of Earth Sciences, and then a PhD in Bristol. He then went to do some postdoctoral positions, first of all in Toronto and then in Yale, and he came back to us in uh, 2019. So Luke's work is focused on the Cambrian explosion, which is an event in the geological record that occurred around 500 million years ago. And the key thing about this is when all the major animal groups first appeared in the fossil record. And one of these groups, I've just checked this with Luke, one of these groups was the worms. And this is what we're going to hear about today. So Luke, over to you. Thanks, Kathy. Brilliant. Uh, OK, let me just get my screen shared. Uh... Okay, hopefully you can see my slides. So there we go. Yeah, so uh, as Kathy said, I'm, today I'm going to be talking about uh, the evolutionary history of worms. So more specifically, I'm going to be talking about uh, annelid worms. Uh, so those are the segmented worms, which are the close relatives of earthworms and leeches and all sorts of other things. But I thought I would just kick off by introducing uh, exactly what an animal is. So as Kathy said, my work focuses on the Cambrian explosion, which is approximately uh, an event that occurred approximately 540, 550 million years ago, where all of the major groups of animals are first appear in the fossil record. And of course, there are lots of different types of animals that are alive today. So vertebrates, so us and our close relatives are probably the, uh, the most familiar. And that includes uh, everything from humans, cats, uh, to cows and, uh, and fish and so forth. But animals uh, encompass a diverse array of different types of body plans and different ways of building an organism. So that can, and uh, a lot of this diversity occurs exclusively in the marine realm. So animals encompass everything from jellyfish to crabs to starfish. So animals are quite special uh, when we look at the modern diversity uh, that's around today. So animals are, are a type of organism that's called a eukaryote. So they're unique in that they have membrane bound organelles. So that's things like the nucleus or the mitochondrion, which you can see. Uh, in diagrammatic form here. They're multicellular, which means that their bodies are made of many different cells that uh, go all, are, all are grouped together to perform different functions. Uh, but, both they, but both of these features are also uh, found in plants and fungi. So what exactly makes animals different? So one of the principal things that animals have uh, is that they're heterotrophic, which means that they depend on uh, external sources of organic matter for food. So this is quite frequently other organisms. Uh, and that's something that we also find in fungi, but not something that we find in plants. But crucially, they're also motile. So they move around at least during part of their life cycle. And they also have a, a type of protein called collagen, which is this intracellular glue that sticks animal cells together and imparts many animal tissues with their biomechanical properties. So uh, these features in combination have allowed animals to become the most complex organisms that are alive today. And they had a single com uh, common ancestor that shared all of these traits. But what I'm going to be talking about mostly today is a group of animals called bilaterian animals. So bilaterians are organisms that are split down the middle into having a left and right side. And they're the only groups around today that have things like complex nervous systems. So this excludes uh, more simple animal groups uh, like sponges and jellyfish and sea anemones and, and all of those sorts of things. So bilaterian animals have evolved a number of different features uh, that allow them to interact with, uh, with other organisms and with their environments that have allowed them to sort of uh, dominate most uh, ecosystems on Earth. And they're probably what you think of when you think of animal diversity, and they re represent the overwhelming bulk of animal biodiversity. So things that they have is having through guts, that's having a mouth and an anus for processing food. They also have appendages for sensing their environment. Uh, so that can be anything from tentacles and limbs and so forth. 
And it's these sorts of features that have allowed animals to do complex things like burrowing. So this is an example of uh, burrowing by a living priapulid worm and then uh, an equivalent burrow from about 540 million years ago. So animals have been doing these complex things for hundreds and hundreds of millions of years. So when we think about uh, what evidence we might find in the fossil record from animals, uh, so they leave a number of different uh, a number of different records in rocks. So probably what you're most familiar with when you think of fossils is what we call sort of normal fossils. So that's shells, teeth, and bones. So hard parts that survive the rigorous geological processes that happen during fossilization. Then we also have uh, evidence of fossilized behavior. So these are what we call trace fossils. So these could be burrows or trackways that are impressed into sediment. Uh, and some examples here are sort of a complex network type burrow. And this is from uh, the Silurian period of Wales. And then something which might be more recognizable. Uh, this is a dinosaur footprint uh, that I photographed on the Isle of Wight. But something I'm going to be touching on for quite a lot of this talk is uh, what you can see on the right hand side here. So these are what, are what we call exceptional fossils. So this is instances where we get just the, uh, the soft parts, so the bits of animals that are, cr are prone to decay, preserving in the fossil record. And that gives a much more complete picture uh, of, what we, uh, uh, of what ancient organisms looked like. And, uh, and what they were doing. So this could be a number of different different tissues. So this could be their skin, this could also be their guts. And as I'll hopefully uh, convince you later, this even includes really, really difficult to preserve things like nervous systems. So when exactly do animals first appear in the fossil record? So this is just a, a brief overview of, uh, of uh, the first four and a half billion years of the history of the planet. So the, uh, the planet is about 4.54 billion years old. And our oldest, uh, our oldest rocks are about just over 4 billion years old. So this is an example here called the Acasta Nice from the Northwest Territories in Canada. And then shortly after, uh, the, the shortly after we get the, the oldest rocks, sort of within a few hundred million years, we get the first evidence for life. So about three and a half billion years ago, we have the evidence for sort of simple chains of cells and uh, simple microbial life. And then it's not actually until about 580 million years ago that we get evidence for large, complex, and multicellular animals. So this example uh, shown here, this sort of frondy, leafy looking organism, this fossil here is a, a fossil called Charnia, which is from Charnwood Forest in Leicestershire. And this is actually a, a quite a famous fossil because it was uh, one of the first fossil organisms that was described from rocks from more than 541 million years ago from an, uh, a period in Earth's history called the Precambrian. So the bulk of the fossil record is known from the Cambrian period and beyond. So from about 541 million years ago to the present day. So looking at when anim exactly animals first appear in the fossil record, we're sort of zo here we're zooming in on uh, the, the last 650-ish uh, million years of Earth history. And this is really where animals start to start to come on the scene. So you can see here that again we have these oldest probable animals, these sort of weird leafy looking in organisms that are found in uh, deep water fossil deposits, uh, both in Leicestershire and also from Newfoundland about 574 million years ago. And then the earliest evidence for sort of motile, bilaterian, complex animals at about 555 million years ago. And then sort of within 20 million years of finding these oldest bilaterian trace fossils, we find almost all of the modern animal groups represented as fossils. So this is everything from arthropods, uh, so like that would be um, spiders, centipedes, flies, and all of their relatives to things like mollusks, so snails, as well as many, many different types of worm. So why exactly is understanding early animal evolution and the origin of animals particularly important? So this is just a summary of what the uh, what Earth's environment was like uh, during this time period from about 660 million years ago uh, on into the Cambrian, so uh, young, rocks younger than 540 million years ago. And we can see that there's a number of different major things that happen uh, to the Earth's surface environments during this time, and, underst and therefore understanding how these events impacted or were impacted by the origin of complex animal life is a really, really important aspect of understanding animal evolution. So you can see here at around about 660 million years ago, we have the first of what's called the snowball Earth glaciations. Uh, and then we have another one of those at about 640 million years ago. There's also massive changes to the carbon cycle that happened during this time period. And so understanding when animals first arrived on the scene is sort of key to understanding Earth's, uh, like the, uh, some of the earliest uh, uh, environmental, major environmental changes uh, to the planet during the, uh, the, uh, during the late Precambrian. So I first got interested in studying early animals and in, particularly, uh, in particular uh, the fossilized remnants of, uh, 
of worms when I was a master's student here at the University of Oxford. So this is a, a picture of a much younger version of myself uh, taken in 2012 uh, with Martin Brazier, who was a, a fellow at Teddy Hall. Uh, and uh, Martin and I, Martin supervised my master's project where we went out to Brazil in 2012 to sample late Precambrian rocks for some of the earliest evidence of animal life. So this culminated in a project that we, uh, we published in 2017, where we found some sort of strange looking fossilized animal burrows, which preserved the evidence of uh, really, really tiny microscopic animals that were living in sediments about, uh, about 540 million years ago. So what we did is that we put these, uh, these rock samples here into a CT scanner to reconstruct them in three dimensions. So this video here just shows uh, we're looking down onto a bedding surface here. This is looking at these uh, three dimensionally preserved remains of ancient animal burrows that are preserved in a mineral called pyrite. So pyrite is an iron sulfide mineral, so it's a lot heavier than the other minerals that are making up the rock. So it's a lot harder to get x-rays to pass through them, which is why we're able to reconstruct them using CT scanning. And these fossils were really, really important because they were evidence of microscopic animals moving around in ancient seafloors. So they told us that this sort of small body size uh, ecological niches, which are really, really important among a lot of animal groups today, were occupied early in animal evolutionary history. And this is also some of the earliest evidence for really complex uh, locomotion in animals. So unfortunately, Martin didn't get to see this, uh, this work published in 2017, but it's actually, uh, as, uh, as he was uh, tragically killed in a car accident in uh, in late 2014, but uh, I'm, I hope that he'd be really proud of this work and it's actually pretty fantastic to be able to present it here at Teddy Hall uh, now that I'm an early career fellow here. So uh, this was, and this was a really a piece of work that uh, sort of slingshotted me into an interest in understanding the earliest worms and the earliest animals. So yeah, so these fossils uh, were made by ancient worms, but you might be thinking what exactly is a worm? And it's sort of a loosely defined, uh, uh, loosely defined term in, sort of, in terms of what it means zoologically. And here is the, the definition from Google. So it's any number of creeping or burrowing invertebrate animals with long slender bodies and no limbs. So the no limbs is something I'll, I would probably dispute as you'll probably, as you'll hopefully see in a few, sli in a few slides time. But uh, worms encompass an awful lot of animal biodiversity. So it's everything from voracious predators, like these arrow worms here, and these large unicid polychaete worms here, to tiny microscopic things like this nematode worm here, things that live in between sand grains like gastrotrichs and rotifers, and all sorts of other things. There are some animals which are worms only during part of their life cycle. So, oh, hang on. So insects, uh, they're, they're larvae of, of vermiform and leave uh, leave burrows and traces in the fossil record, which are an awful lot like uh, traces that we see made by other worms. So worms encompass an awful lot of, of animal biodiversity. So for quite a lot of this talk, I'm going to be talking about, um, about evolution with reference to evolutionary trees. And it's really evolutionary trees that we need to understand where these vermiform body plants came from. So uh, this is a, a sketch here from one of Darwin's notebooks that shows an evolutionary tree. So it's, a, it's showing the interrelationships of a number of different organisms. So uh, this is just a more simplified version on the right hand side. So we can see organisms A, B and C and a number of branches that are leading to them. And then uh, labeled with these blue circles here are nodes. So you can think of these as just being the common ancestors of these groups. So this node here is the common ancestor of B and C. So if we want to think about uh, evolution and the origin of worms in a sort of phylogenetic or evolutionary tree context, uh, we first have to look at what the, ev the evolutionary relationships among animals all look like. So this is a phylogenetic tree where the branches uh, depict related, the branches and nodes of this diagram depict relationships between uh, the major different animal groups. So on the right hand side, oh, sorry, on the left hand side here, we have peripherans or sponges. Uh, and then here we have cnidarians, which is jellyfish and sea anemones and so on. So we have echinoderms, which is starfish, arthropods. So, uh, so this is everything from spiders and flies, moths, butterflies, centipedes, and so on. Mollusks, so snails, octopuses, and so on. Annelids, which are a group of worms that I'm going to talk about a little bit more today. And then us. And if we look at this diagram in a little bit more detail, I've highlighted here in yellow text all of the groups which are more or less worms. So you can see that when we look at the evolution, if we look at animal diversity in an evolutionary context, much of it is dominated by worms. So, okay. 
So there we go. Yeah, worms are a lot of animal biodiversity. So the group that I'm going to be focusing on more today, though, is the Spiralia or Lophotrochozoa, which is the group to which the annelid worms belong. So this is the segmented worms, so earthworms and all of their close relatives. So this is what uh, Spiralian diversity looks like. So this is an evolutionary tree of Spiralians, and you can see that it's dominated by a number of different groups of worms. Some of these are really, really unfamiliar, so things like rotifers and gastrotrix, but others are maybe a bit more familiar. So mollusks is a group that encompasses things like snails and octopuses, but some of their diversity is also represented by worms. So this is uh, something that's called an aplacophoran or a shellless mollusk that has a sort of very, very vermiform body plan. So the group that I'm going to be focusing in on today is annelid worms. So as I've said a number of times, the uh, the annelid worms are probably something that you're most familiar with in, uh, from the from earthworms and leeches, which are sort of ubiquitous in modern terrestrial environments, and they're sort of being they're sort of viewed as being really essential uh, for life on land in terms of what they do for uh, for modern soil communities. But annelids belong to this huge diversity of form, a lot of which is uh, restricted entirely to the ocean. So these animals here are what we call polychaete worms. So polychaete worms uh, are so-called because they have these bristly bodies uh, with many, many bristles that are repeated down their length, which is what you can see on this, uh, particularly prominent on this, this animal here. And they perform a number of different roles in modern ecosystems. So some of them are filter feeders uh, or suspension feeders, like this spaghetti worm here, which is so-called because it has this sort of crown of spaghetti-like tentacles on its head. Uh, another group of filter feeding worms are these Christmas tree worms, which are these uh, colorful and festive looking animals down here, uh, which here are bored into a coral reef and again are filtering organic matter from, uh, from the water column. Uh, they also include a number of different voracious predators, so thing, something that I'm going to be touching on a little bit more uh, uh, later on in this talk. So this is an example of, of a unicid polychaete here, and these live as ambush predators. And some of these get very, very big, so up to a few meters long, which is something I'll be talking about here. And then there are a few with uh, slightly more baffling common names. So this animal here is referred to as the cat worm, presumably because of its resemblance in some sense to a cat, but I've never really figured out where this name comes from. So yeah, so what does a polychaete look like? So polychaetes are these segmented animals, so their bodies are made up of many, many repeated units uh, where, they, uh, where they have self-similar limbs, uh, repeated down their body, equipped with bristles that they that perform a number of different functions. Whether it's not whether or not that's gripping in sediments, uh, walking around on the seafloor, or sensory functions, or even processing food and things like that. So polychaetes have this segmented body plan, and it's the plasticity of this body plan where they can repurpose some of these segments to perform different functions that has allowed them to become really really diverse organisms today. So although they don't, con this group doesn't contain as many species as a group like arthropods. So arthropods dominate uh, biodiversity in terms of number of species. Polychaete worms are quite frequently the most abundant macrofaunal organisms, so large-bodied animals that you find in most marine ecosystems. So although they, they, don't, they don't contain as many species as the most species group, this segmented body plan has allowed them to become really, really dominant uh, ecologically in a lot of the ocean. So this is what the, uh, the phylogenetic tree of annelid worms looks like. So you can see that we have the familiar earthworms here and then a whole host of, of polychaete worms here. And one thing that you'll notice is that these polychaete worms branch off at different points throughout, uh, throughout this phylogenetic tree. And that shows us that the features that we see in polychaetes, so having this multi-segmented body plan with these prominent limbs and bristles, uh, are features that are, are plesiomorphic or primitive for the group. And they also originated in the marine realm. So earthworms made it onto land at some point after the origin of annelids. So these animals look sort of soft and squishy, and you might expect that they don't have a particularly good potential to preserve as, fossil, as fossils. So what exactly do annelid fossils look like? And so for the rest of the talk, I'm going to give you a, a few of, the, of what I think at least are the greatest hits of the annelid fossil record, and some of the really interesting things that I found since I started studying them as a PhD student in 2013. So this is a sort of brief overview of the different things that we might find as annelid fossils. Uh, this is a, a stratigraphic column uh, showing uh, Earth history from the Cambrian period up to the present day here. And in star, and shown with the stars here are different sites where we have exceptional uh, preservation of annelids. So that's where we get preservation of the whole body of annelid fossils. So that's everything from their skin, their guts, occasionally their muscle tissue, sometimes their nervous systems. And then alongside that is the sort of more conventional fossil record. So that's things like their hard parts. 
So I'm just going to talk about these uh, sort of conventional fossils that most readily survive fossilization first before I move on to these sort of more spectacular fossils which form the bulk of my research. So one thing that we find really prominently in the fossil record of annelids are fossilized tubes. So a lot of annelids build these hard uh, dwelling structures in which they make their living. And a group, a group that does this really prominently is a group called serpulids. And some of these do this so extensively that they build reefs in the modern ocean. And these, don't, these, uh, these organisms don't really arrive on the scene uh, until uh, a, a, a time in Earth history called the, uh, the Lake Carboniferous. So they arrive about 300 million years ago. That's when we have the first evidence for the, the close relatives of serpulids. And then they become sort of really robust and biomineralized uh, sort of, uh, in this sort of few uh, few hundred years following, and they start building their first reefs during the uh, during the Triassic period, so just over two hundred million years ago. So I haven't really done much research on on circulids, so I'm not really going to talk about these very much uh, in this talk. But they're really really important in terms of their forming the bulk of the annelid fossil record. So these are really really common as fossils. But one thing that we do find really really uh, commonly as fossils is the jaws of polychaete annelids. So you might not think that uh, these soft, squishy worms are, are going to be equipped with sort of some horrifying looking mouth parts, but they're actually, re they're, they're actually quite common in a lot of different groups of polychaetes. And a lot of polychaetes are actually voracious predators. So uh, this is an example of something called a scale worm. So they have four, uh, four of these different jaws that they use to bite dorsally and ventrally. Uh, then there's also a group called the glycerids or the blood worms here that also have these four uh, black jaws. And these are actually quite voracious animals. So um, in, when I first started my PhD, I was going out to a marine station in Bergen in Norway uh, to collect uh, a load of different annelid worms for sequencing. And we found that these were, re these were really, really common and they were all also really, really aggressive. So when we were sorting through our, our samples, trying to identify all of the different species that we collected, we found that these glycerid worms were going around and biting all of the other worms that, we've collect that we'd collected. And they're quite venomous. So they were actually killing an awful lot of the, uh, of the worms that we were trying to collect. So when we went out and on subsequent collecting trips, we were really keen to sort out all the glycerids away from, the, uh, away from all of the, the other polychaete worms to stop, stop them sort of uh, killing the others because we needed to collect them uh, alive for some of the experiments that we wanted to do later. So there's, uh, these are, there's also another group uh, of jawed polychaetes called uh, uh, nereids or ragworms. So these might be quite familiar to you if you've ever gone fishing. So you may have actually seen the jaws of these worms if you've used this, uh, uh, this animal as, uh, as fishing bait. And then there's another group which has these really, really beautifully complex jaws. So they have many, many uh, of these asymmetrical jaw elements uh, making up their jaws. And it's these that I'm going to talk a little bit more about today. Uh, and they're, they're actually the ones that we find most commonly as fossils. So this is a group of annelids called the unicids. So uh, when we talk about fossil annelid jaws, we call them skelecodonts. And they first appear in the fossil record about uh, 480 million years ago in a, in a period of time called the early Ordovician. And they diversify rapidly. And they're actually really, really commonly, uh, commonly found as fossils. They're also quite often tiny. Uh, so this is a scanning electro, uh, electron microscope image of some typical annelid jaws from the fossil record here. And each of these jaws is only about a millimeter in length. And the way that you find these jaws is by taking large amounts of, of uh, sedimentary rocks, uh, putting them in acid, uh, dissolving away all of the minerals that are in the rocks, leaving all, only the, uh, the small amounts of, of organic components that are in the rocks, then carefully sieving through them, picking out all of the individual jaw elements, and then uh, uh, identifying them uh, and seeing what the diversity is in your samples. So this is the, the typical setup that you go from sort of bulk rock collecting to something that looks a little bit more like this. So it's quite an involved process to get these, uh, to get these jaws out of, um, out of these rock samples. So uh, in 2017, we found a new, uh, a new species ba uh, based on some fossilized jaws that we found from uh, a time period called the early middle, early middle Devonian, about 400 million years ago, uh, from rocks that were found in northern Ontario in, Can uh, in Canada. And this is a species that we called Websteroprion armstrongi. And unlike these fossil jaws that I showed on the previous slide, we found these just by cracking the specimens out of, um, out of blocks of limestone. When I say we, I don't actually mean me, because uh, these fossils were actually first collected in 1994 uh, by a team, including a colleague of mine called Dave Rudkin from the uh, Royal Ontario Museum. And I was visiting the museum in 2014, I think, uh, to, to work on another project. And he pulled these out of a drawer and they've been sitting there unstudied since 1994. But he was quite excited to show them to me. And I was really struck by one thing in particular when I saw them. And that was the fact that they were really, really large. 
So these jaws, unlike the typical jaws that we, we find in living annelids, are about 12 millimeters in length. Uh, so they're sort of about 10 times the size of what we typically find uh, in annelid fossil jaws. Uh, and I was able to put these into a CT scanner uh, to find jaws that we couldn't see exposed on the rock surface and reconstruct them in, the, in three dimensions in a little bit more detail. And then based on, the, uh, based on the, the sort of shape and morphology of these jaws, we were able to pin them down to a modern group of unicid polychaetes, which has allowed us to do a sort of fairly accurate 3D uh, uh, artist reconstruction of what this animal would have looked like in life, uh, this sort of large voracious predator. Uh, predator. So exactly how big was this, was this fossil animal? So we have a number of species alive today whose uh, jaws are, are over 12 millimeters in length. And all, every time we find one of, these, uh, one of these animals alive today, they're usually over a meter long. So this animal would have been a gigantic predator uh, in, the, uh, in the Devonian Sea about 400 million years ago. But one thing that's really notable is uh, actually we, we think that this species does not belong, is not closely related to any of the living gigantic uh, predatory polychaete worms that we find today. So it evolved this, uh, this large body size independently of the groups that we find alive today. So it's an independent excursion into this gigantic predatory body size. And so this is just showing you what these animals are like today, sort of living as sit and wait ambush predators. So in this burrow here is a modern unicid polychaete that's pulling this uh, rather unfortunate fish down into its burrow. So these are really, really fascinating animals. And it was great to find uh, evidence of this sort of large body size, pre size predator uh, in, the, uh, in the early fossil record of this group. So moving on, uh, for the rest of my talk, I'm going to be talking about uh, the soft-bodied fossils. So fossils that preserve the really, really decay-prone decay soft parts of annelid worms. So uh, this slide here just shows a classic experiment from 1993 that showed that annelids, annelid bodies decay really, really rapidly. So even under some really tightly controlled conditions, they'd, uh, you'd end up with only sort of their bristles and little scraps of their cuticle and their jaws after 30 days, uh, af from after 30 days after they died. Uh, and this is something that I've uh, inadvertently discovered in some of my own experiments, uh, where some of my samples uh, sadly did not survive the fixing process. Um, so yeah, so annelid bodies decay, uh, decay and disaggregate really, really soon after their death. But fortunately for paleontologists, we have some instances where this doesn't happen. And this is where we get what we call exceptionally preserved fossils. So in the terms of annelids, the sorts of things that we get here are, are their cuticles, so their sort of uh, their skin, which is not hard, it's sort of soft, collagenous, and squishy. Uh, so uh, we also get their appendages, so their antennae, their parapodia, so these fleshy limbs that branch from their bodies, uh, and as well as uh, more rarely preserved tissues like muscle, gu muscles, guts, and even brains. And these require sort of special geological conditions uh, for these fossils to form. And we don't have a really continuous record of these through time. So we see that we have a number of uh, deposits where we get them in the Cambrian period, sort of maybe one in the, in the following Ordovician period, and then a few sort of scattered throughout the next few hundred million years of, of, uh, of Earth history. So exceptionally preserved fossils are really, really important for us as paleontologists if we want to understand ancient life and eco ancient ecosystems and the origin of modern biodiversity. So this here is an example of what the Cambrian seafloor would have looked like. So this is a scene from about 505 million years ago from a deposit called the Burgess Shale. What this would look like if we only had the hard parts of the, uh, of the organisms that lived there. So you can see that we have a, a few things which might be easy to recognize like trilobites, other hard things like brachiopods and, spon and sponges and so forth. But if we add in the components that are only known from their soft parts, we get a much, uh, much great, more greatly enhanced picture of ancient biodiversity. And we can see that this looks a lot more like a modern flourishing ecosystem. And it's only really by studying these exceptional uh, fossils that we get these windows into ancient life. So I'm going to talk a little bit now about uh, something from my early PhD work where we found instances of uh, fossilized soft tissue. So this is from uh, not too long ago in geological terms. So these fossils are about about 90 million years old from the, uh, from the late Cretaceous of Lebanon. So a lot of the fossils here sort of are not particularly impressive. They're sort of vague, blurry outlines of these partially decayed polychaete worms. But we find rare instances where we find evidence of fossilized, uh, fossilized soft tissues like mussels. So th these are some specimens of a, of a fossil polychaete worm. So this is the first species that I ever named. Um, and what you can see, this white material is all a mineral called calcium phosphate. And calcium phosphate is really well known for having this ability to replicate uh, soft, soft tissues of uh, different organisms, in particular muscle, which is what we see here. And uh, these fossils have actually been lit under UV light. 
So calcium phosphate is a mineral that, uh, that fluoresces really strongly when exposed to UV light. So this picture here is what the fossil looks like normally, and above is the same region under UV light. So that was a really useful tool for studying the anatomy of these organisms. We also put them into a scanning electron microscope, and that gave us a window into how, uh, how extremely well preserved these, these animals really were. So what you can see here in all of these images is that these sort of striations made up of these like little microspheres of this mineral calcium phosphate, uh, individual muscle fibers that have been faithfully uh, replicated by this, uh, by this mineralization process. And we were able to look at the details of the muscle anatomy of this animal and then compare it to the muscle anatomy of living annelid worms and pin it down to belonging to a group of, uh, of annelids called the fireworms, which are these voracious predators that live on modern day coral reefs. So it, uh, the details of this are not particularly important, but we found that it has a muscle arrangement that's only known in this group. So this is a cross section through a living, uh, a living fireworm that was made using scanning electron micros microscopy. And then we found a, num a number of other features in these animals that sort of corroborated that uh, in terms of the, the features that were on the head and, and things like that. So this was a really, really fantastic sort of first insight in, in my work into what, what fantastic and really sort of impressive features we can get preserved in these unique fossils. So now for the rest of the talk, I'm going to move down, uh, down through Earth history to the Cambrian period. So that's just over 500 million years ago and talk about my work on exceptionally preserved fossil polychaetes in the Cambrian. So I mentioned, uh, mentioned this briefly. So we have this deposit from just over 500 million years ago called the Berger Shale, which was discovered by a, a scientist from the Smithsonian Museum called Charles Doolittle Walcott uh, in the early 20th century. So in, uh, I think first discovered in 1905. And he found this uh, spectacular array of really, really impressively well-preserved fossils, which, imp which includes a number of different types of worms. So this is a priapulid worm here, and then this is a, a polychaete worm here, which is the, the uh, going to be the focus of quite a lot of the rest of the talk. And these are really, really impressive and spectacularly preserved fossils. And some of them are really, really easily recognizable as the sort of uh, evolutionary precursors of groups that we still find alive today. So this arthropod here is a uh, is a close relative of living crustaceans. And then we still find things like brachiopods around today. And then we have a host of other slightly more unusual fossils like this spiny mollusk here called Wiwaxia. So I was fortunate enough to go to one of, uh, to one of the Berger Shale localities uh, to do field work in 2018. Uh, so this is, quite a, this is a newly discovered locality that's quite remote. And uh, so it's only access accessible by helicopter. And we had to stay, this is our, a picture of our field camp here, which we called home for about four weeks. Uh, so. Uh, this was actually my first uh, ride in a helicopter up to uh, to visit this site. Ooh, hang on. Up to visit this site. Uh, also, my first time using a uh, <clears throat> using some really uh, heavy duty power tools to crack through rocks as well. So this was great, especially seeing some of these really really spectacular fossils uh, come out of the rocks for the first time up in this field locality. So these are uh, these fossils are really really interesting in their own right, and what I'm particularly interested in is in. Uh, understanding exactly what these Berger Shale type fossils tell us about evolutionary history. So how we can use their, anat their unique anatomies uh, to understand uh, where the living diversity of animals came from. So this is uh, just a few more examples of some, some sort of the weird beasts that come from the Berger Shale, particularly some of the early arthropods. And these, uh, the sort of weirdness of some of these fossils was really sort of uh, stressed in Stephen Jay Gould's book, Wonderful Life, that was published in the 1980s. But yeah, so what about the fossil annelids? So uh, these are a couple of examples of the fossil polychaete worms that we find from the Berger Shale. So uh, these are really, really interesting. So they're, they're really, really bristly animals. They're large and they're very, very impressively well preserved. And based on some of the work that I've done previously, we've shown that these animals sort of belong outside of the living diversity of annelid worms. So the, the last common ancestor of, uh, of all living annelid worms that we see today, uh, they branched away from each other after, uh, after these fossils branched away. So they're, what, they're part of what we call the annelid stem group. So they're really, really useful for understanding exactly how the annelid body, body plan was put together early in its evolutionary history. So this is a fossil I'm gonna be talking about quite a bit now. So this is an animal called Canadia spinosa, which is this really impressively well-preserved annelid fossil from the, uh, from the Cambrian Berger Shale. Uh, so here we go. So yeah, so one thing that I was particularly struck by is how uh, these, these fossils actually differ quite markedly from what we, we might predict based on the living diversity of, uh, of annelid worms uh, to, in terms of what they look like for understanding the oldest, uh, the oldest radiation of this group. So all of these annelid, annelid fossils are really, really bristly and they have uh, big appendages uh, that are used for locomotion and sensing their environment. 
Whereas the, the groups that we think of within annelids as being most primitive are things which are often burrowing uh, in sediment. And we only have a few of the primitive groups that are actively crawling around. So this was sort of really suggestive that perhaps uh, these burrowing groups have evolved, uh, have evolved this mode of life secondarily. So when we're observing these fossils, uh, we have to use a number of different techniques in order to understand them in terms of, uh, in terms of photographing and lighting them. Uh, but fortunately, one thing that we do have access to is preservation of these fossils in a number of different orientations that allow us to reconstruct their original anatomy in three dimensions. So this here is a view looking down on top of one of these spectacularly uh, preserved fossils. Uh, so this is, uh, this is what the, the top surface of the animal would have looked like. And then this is another fossil that we have preserved here, which is looking at the lateral view of the, of the animal. So we have a number of different fossils that are, allow us to reconstruct its anatomy in three dimensions. And then this is just focusing on the, the head region of the animal. So this is, a, this is the head of this animal, Canadia. And you can see it has these many bristly appendages branching from its body. And then these two sensory tentacles at the front. So this is what it looks like from the top. And then these two views are what we have looking at the sides. So this allowed us to do a sort of updated reconstruction of what the 3D anatomy of this animal would have looked like, and also what it would have looked like in three dimensions and how it would have appeared sort of stomping around on the seafloor just over 500 million years ago. But one of the really, really spectacular things about these ancient fossils is that they still replicate some of their features in the original carbon that made up their tissues. So this is a few images just focusing in on a, a little gill, so a little gas exchange organism, a uh, gas exchange organ that, uh, that branches along the body of this animal Canadia. And what we can see here on the right hand side, this is a scanning electron microscope uh, image, as well as a, an elemental map using uh, energy dispersive x-ray analysis that shows the distribution of elemental carbon in the fossil. And you can see that this organ in particular is replicated uh, in carbon. And when we were looking at these sort of really, really dark, uh, dark features, so the, the features that are preserved in carbon are always, always have this sort of black coloration. One thing that I was, I was struck by is that there was this uh, sort of unique pattern of this, uh, this ring shaped uh, looking distribution of carbon uh, in the head region, as well as these black carbon films that went uh, on into the appendages along the body and into the, uh, these tentacles that sit on the head as well. And I was struck by how similar this looked to the, uh, the annelid nervous system. So annelids have this prom So this is a, a sort of small polychaete worm here where the, the, the nervous system has been shown in this red stain. Uh, and you can see that it has this loop that forms around the mouth, uh, this nerve cord that runs along its body, and then lots of nerves that branch off going into its appendages. So we put this into an electron micro uh, microscope and then we mapped it out for carbon. And we found this really, really striking pattern, which was closely similar to what we find in the nervous system of living annelids. And uh, after looking at all of the available material, we had this really, really consistent pattern of these carbonaceous features being uh, restricted to preserving features inside the head, looping around the mouth and entering in into the appendages. And we found that not only in the head, but also running along the body axis. So we also found preservation of uh, evidence of the ventral nerve cord of this animal as well. So really, really spectacular preservation of the morphology of this animal. So fossil brains in the, uh, in the fossil record are not completely unprecedented. So they were first described from similarly aged rocks from China uh, in 2012 in an animal called Fushin Huia uh, by my colleague Xiaoyang Ma, who's now at uh, the, uh, the University of Exeter and Yunnan University. So these are sort of dis these discrete bilaterally symmetrical uh, carbonaceous features that seem to replicate quite faithfully the original morphology of these animals' nervous systems. And these have now been found in a number of different localities, particularly in the Cambrian, including the Burgess Shale and many other similar localities. So what might the, uh, the features that we see in, the annelid, in this early annelid nervous system tell us about annelid, uh, uh, tell us about annelid evolution? So in these groups that um, zoologists think of being primitive among annelids, so these things like oenids, megalonids, and all of these other groups, uh, quite often they have quite simple nervous systems. So they have uh, just this loop-like brain and then a simple nerve cord. And then some, some of them also have more complex arrangements like in this fireworm, uh, like I showed for that muscle preservation example earlier. But Canadia shows that actually we have quite a complex nervous system present in some of these most ancient annelid fossils. And it's probably most likely that these groups that are still around today that have very, very simple neuroanatomical arrangements have actually reduced their, uh, their nervous system. So for the final part of my talk, I'm just gonna talk a little bit more about a new discovery that we made earlier this year that sort of fills in some of the gaps in our knowledge about the early evolution of annelids and something that actually belongs and is the first representative that we see in the fossil record 
of the living diversity of annelids. So not these sort of like really, really ancient deep branches in the, in the annelid tree of life. And I'm in particular going to focus down on these really primitive living families that form the, uh, the deepest divergences uh, in the annelid tree of life. So as I said on a, a few slides ago, we have these really primitive extant families that are recovered, uh, recovered as these deep branches in the annelid tree of life, which contrast quite markedly with these sort of uh, complex and motile forms that we find early in the fossil record. And crucially, many of these groups that we think of as being primitive have either no fossil record or, di or a disputed fossil record, which is in some instances, ooh, hang on, quite young. So these uh, tube-dwelling Oweenids here only occur at about uh, five million years ago in the fossil record, and these other groups only have either no fossil record or a disputed ancient fossil record. So uh, when I was visiting China a few years ago to work on a different project, we were shown these sort of rather scruffy looking annelid fossils uh, but upon closer examination under the microscope, we found that they had some sort of really unique features that we don't see in other fossilized annelids. So here you can see the, uh, the head region of this annelid preserved. So it has these really, really elongate tentacles. And then we can see the, the segmented body here with the, all of these bristly appendages. Uh, so these, uh, these keti sticking off from the side here. And we were able to use some uh, other techniques like fluorescence microscopy to get a handle on exactly what this animal looked like. And we found that it actually most closely resembled this group called Magalonids, which are a primitive group of li uh, living annelid worms that are around in the, uh, still around in the modern ocean, uh, that until now had no known fossil record. We found another, uh, a few other striking features in these fossils. So one other thing was that they lived in tubes. Uh, so they are actually completely sessile and are not moving around on the ancient seafloor. And that's something that we don't see in any other annelid for sort of several hundreds of millions of years. So this is quite a, new, a unique find in the early annelid fossil record. And then, in, and then we, we looked in a bit more detail and also in the, in the morphology, so the shape and arrangement of the limbs that sit, around, sit down the body, we also found some close similarities. But it really was the fact that we found it living in a tube, which was most unique about this early annelid fossil. And we were able to reconstruct it as the sort of most ancient uh, sessile, so non-motile annelid in the fossil record. And that really, really helped to fill our gaps in our understanding of, uh, of early annelid evolution. And uh, this fossil we named after a guy called Danny I.B. Jacobson, who's a scientist at the University of uh, Copenhagen at the Natural History Museum, who sort of sat me down at the start of my PhD and taught me all about the, the morphology of annelid worms. So it was really, really crucial in me developing my understanding of this group. So yeah, so this fossil helps us sort of fill in the gaps of the earliest and most ancient fossil record of this group. And it's quite an exciting find in terms of how different it is to other annelids that we find in the Cambrian period. So I'm just going to close up and finish up with a few slides uh, talking about uh, a more recent piece of work that I'm still working on uh, that actually I started a few years ago in the lab sequencing a bunch of, uh, of different still living annelid worms. So this is focusing on earthworms, so the most familiar group of living segmented worms. And earthworms have, have sort of fascinated evolutionary biologists even since the time of Darwin. So Darwin's last ever book was written about the importance of earthworms. And earthworms are seen as being this really, really essential component of modern terrestrial ecosystems and modern, uh, modern terrestrial soils. And in this book, it said, Darwin said, it, uh, Darwin said it may be doubted whether there are many other animals which have played so important a part in the history of the world as have these lowly creatures. And they are really, really essential for the functioning of modern soils. But actually what we find is if invasive earthworms, so earthworms that don't belong in a particular, uh, in a particular ecosystem are introduced. So this is particularly a problem in uh, bits of North America where earthworms are no longer found natively as they were wiped out by the, uh, the, by, the, by the recent glaciations. We find that they have a really strongly negative effect on some of the, on, on biodiversity. So this graph here shows that they have a, a negative impact on both the density and diversity of invertebrates that you find in soils. And uh, this, is this sort of manifests itself in, in a way that we might be more concerned about uh, in, in, the forms, uh, in the form of how it, how it impacts trees. So earthworms, invasive earthworms in New England in particular, have been uh, implicated in the decline of sugar maples. So earthworms, although they're really, really crucial in the ecosystems where they're found natively, actually can have some quite uh, negative impacts uh, on modern ecosystems. So what we did, so, but quite crucially, earthworms also have effectively no fossil record. So they have these soft and squishy bodies, which often excludes annelids from being fossilized, but they also don't live in the sorts of environments that we typically find fossils in. So we don't really have a very, very good understanding of when annelids first arrived on the scene in the history of the planet. 
So we try to address this by uh, sequencing what's called the transcriptome of a number of different uh, a number of different earthworms, and then combining this data with information from the fossil record in what's called a molecular clock analysis, which is a way that you can combine fossil evidence with genetic evidence to infer when organisms uh, diverge from each other in the distant past. And we found that earthworms originated around about 300 million years ago during a period in time uh, called the Carboniferous. And the Carboniferous is quite famous for producing coal swamps. So it's the period in time where most of our coal comes from, as well as these spectacular Carboniferous uh, coal forests. And actually around about 300 million years ago, which is the time that we infer that earthworms first arrived on the scene, is when, when these Carboniferous coal forests disappear from the fossil record uh, forever. And at the moment, we're trying to understand what role uh, earthworms exactly might have played in this uh, decline of uh, Carboniferous coal forests. Uh, sort of uh, trying to understand uh, how they might have, uh, how they might be implicated in these major climatic changes that were occurring at that time. And these are just a few examples of some uh, spectacular Carboniferous fossils uh, collected from between uh, Bristol and Bath uh, just a few months ago this year. Ooh, my slides have gone a bit AWOL. Um, so these are Carboniferous plant fossils from between Bath and Bristol uh, that are sort of representative of these Carboniferous coal forests that completely disappear from the fossil record around about the same time that earthworms first arrive on the scene. So yeah, just that's all I've got to say uh, about the sort of greatest hits of analytic evolutionary history. And I'd just like to thank all of you for listening, uh, as well as everybody who's, who's collaborated with me, hosted me or given me access to fossil, mu uh, fossil specimens and other technical assistance over the years. So to sort of summarize, uh, apparently my first bullet point only says worms. I'm sure that wasn't meant to be the case, but annelids are the segmented worms uh, and on land they're represented by earthworms and leeches, but they have this much higher diversity called polychaetes in the ocean. They have this rich fossil record that stretches back over half a billion years. And that's given us some really, really uh, important insights into annelid evolutionary history. So thank you again for listening. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Luke. Um, absolutely fascinating. I think I've learned more about worms in the last hour than I've probably ever, ever realized. I mean, I was very naive about them. I was very worried by the size of some of those jaw parts, I have to say. I didn't realize that worms are quite as, uh, could be quite so aggressive.